Mankur, and today I'll be talking about a dynamic parallel doc ops. So I start off talking about the motivation for this feature. Then I'll talk about the state machine for queued spin locks. And then I'll talk about, uh, you know, what does switching PV lock ops, what, what does that involve? Uh, mostly the, the requirements and, you know, what do we need for safety? And then I'll talk about the patching mechanism, which is breakpoint based and the, the design and, and the implementation of V1 and then the design of the V2 for this feature. So this whole thing started with wanting yes to be more dynamic and dynamic specifically in the sense that uh, KVM advertises to guests, um, a KVM host advertises to, to guests, you know, this uh, feature, whether the, the VCPUs for the, for the guest are oversubscribed or not. And if they're not, then in, in quite a lot of respects, it's fairly similar to bare metal where, you know, at least you know that a different uh, process will not schedule out your vCPU. And, and, and so if the hint is true, uh, a KVM guest would basically use native PV locks. If it isn't, uh, meaning it is possible that, that your uh, threats, vCPU threats can get scheduled out you use Paravert PV lock ops. And that, that's, that's good, except that if this, this hint becomes untrue at some point in the lifetime of the guest, um, you know, the, the host could, could move to an oversubscribed mode for, for whatever reason, and the guest has uh, no control over that then typically, you know, the guest would see soft lockups. And, and you know, the, the recommended fix for this is that a host should only advertise this particular feature uh, or this particular hint, if it can guarantee the, the hint for the lifetime of the guest. Now that seems kind of reasonable, but um, it, it does seem unsatisfying. Uh, given that most of this presentation is about um, switching power locks, which are based on 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 queued spin locks, let's uh, you know go over some of the interfaces involved. Um, so there are five interfaces for this, and you know you can see them all of them outlined in, in blue. Interestingly, the the one interface which is which is not a PV lock op is queued spin spin lock. And, and that's pretty interesting. And, and you know, that's a fact that, that, that uh, causes a fair amount of trouble, you know, when you're talking about switching these, because now you have no way of gating entry into, um, into the state machine, essentially, right? Um, you, you, you can gate the PV lock ops, but you cannot gate queued spin lock. For one thing, you don't even know, or, you know, all the call sites that queued spin lock um, is, is called from. Um, so the other notable thing in this uh, state machine is, is, you know, the squiggly lines. So all of the interfaces on the other side of those, that's basically fate kick. Um, and VCPU is preempted as somewhat special, I'll, I'll come to it. But uh, wait and kick are basically no ops for, for the native case. Um, did, which of course, I mean, makes sense. Um, for the, for, in KVM, wait is KVM wait. It basically goes and does a halt uh, in, in the host and, and kick essentially, so it does a KVM hyper call. And, you know, it, it, it does what you would really expect. So, so now uh, having seen the state machine, Let's go a little bit into why don't we just use power locks uh, all the time. Um, so you can see that, it, you know, the unlock fast path is different for, for both of them. And this slide doesn't say which is which, but I'm sure it's easy to guess that, you know, the native case, it's just literally a move. The power case is a locked compare exchange. And, uh, you know, if, if that compare exchange fails, you, you take the slow path 
where you um, find the next node and kick it. Um, and I mean, clearly they are optimized for different use cases, but you would pay the extra cost of a, a compare exchange, even when you don't, don't need it. Um, okay. Another example is that queued spin lock slow path. It's uh, pessimistic by default for, for Paravolt. Uh, so in the native case, case you know, um, queued spin lock slow path would, um, you know, spin for a little bit, uh, and then queue up, uh, if it still hasn't gotten a lock. Paravolt case, the first thing it does is it gets the MCS node, you know, in preparation to, to kind of queue up. All right, now that I've hopefully convinced you uh, on why we need this feature, what does it uh, involve? So fundamentally what you need to do is you have five interfaces. Um, these are spread all over you know, the kernel modules and so on. And you need to switch all of them atomically. What does actually uh, switching them involve? So, you know, this is the example of spin unlock. So you have to transform between the, the opcodes between, you know, one of, uh, fr from one to the other uh, sequence. And of course you might be doing it like multiple times. Um, so the native queued spin unlock, as I think I showed on a previous slide, it's, it's basically a move three bytes and uh, a four byte no op. The PV queued spin unlock is a, is a call to the actual function which you know, does the queuing and it's an exchange uh, which is basically a two byte no op. The, the, the call is interesting because you know, it's a call. Now you imagine a different CPU is doing the patching um, while you know one CPU is in the PVQ spin unlock call and, and it's called you know whatever this address might be. Then it when this guy returns uh, the queued spin unlock when it returns from the call, it returns to address five and you know, it expects to execute 6690. However, if you have managed to finish the, the switching by that point, um, the contents of address uh, five here are 4000. And as you can imagine, that probably will not go very well. And, you know, just to belabor the point a little bit more, uh, you might you might have other ops which uh, similarly go from a call plus no op two to just a no op seven or back. Uh, now, one nice thing is that spin locks cannot sleep. They could be present for, for active threats, but they will not be present for sleeping threats. And, and that's great. All right, so what are the possible active users uh, of spin locks while we are doing this patching? So it, it's really the standard suspects. You have tasks, you have software queues, uh, you have interrupt handlers, you have NMI handlers. The, the, the only thing which might not be taking spin lock is if it's in a user thread context. Interrupt handlers especially are, are interesting because uh, the mechanism, which I, I'll, I'll describe a little more uh, in a later slide, is textbook BP, which uses breakpoints. And it, it's essentially a three-phased uh, um, patching process for, for each call site. And, and so you would you know, do a, a write, write an opcode. Um, after you've finished writing the opcode, you need to synchronize, you need to ensure that all CPU pipelines, they're synchronized. Um, so the caches are synchronized by, by default. What you have to worry about is the pipeline synchronization. Um, because it's possible that, you know, you have the pipeline cache, which has, uh, which is prefetched prefetched, you know, some of these instructions, uh, maybe they've been decoded into micro ops and so on. Uh, so, so the IPI is sent out to, to essentially synchronize the pipeline. And uh, essentially what happens in the IPI is that, you know, when the remote CPU receives an IPI, it executes 
uh, or it will eventually execute an IRET. So it make sure that it synchronizes the pipeline such that it fetches the, the recent, the, the latest version of instructions written. So IPIs also take spin logs. So, so yeah, we need to be kind of prepared for it or handle it in some way. All right, now let's uh, talk a little bit about the mechanism that we'll use for this. So the mechanism is a fairly standard uh, Linux mechanism, um, which which we use for modifying cross modifying code. Uh, th th there's a there's a typo in, in that in the second line. Uh, the problem it solves is of patching while potentially executing code that is being patched. And the, the great thing about this is that it's a single byte instruction. Um, so, so, you, so you know that you can always atomically uh, both write it and execute it. Um, and the, the way you use it is by writing the, replacing the first byte of the sequence that you are that you're modifying by you know this opcode. Um, it serves as a barrier to 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 entry. Uh, the 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 one thing that you do need for that is that uh, this instruction sequence that that you are in the process of writing should have just one entry uh, from you know it should only be entered from the first by from the from the first byte which you just replaced with zero xcc. And you know, if, if this barrier gets hit, uh, the control flow shifts to the in, in three handler, and in the in, in three handler, based on the on the address of uh, where this was hit, you know, um, you, you know what what is the sequence that was supposed to be there, or you know that you know that was a PV lockup or or what have you. So so you know what you should emulate now. And and PV lock ops, um, they they start their life uh, when the kernel boots as, as indirect calls. So fundamentally, you are really just just executing those indirect calls, which are functionally equivalent to the to the opcodes that were stored here. All right. Uh, now let's talk about what we actually do in V one. So one way of sidestepping, you know, a lot of the difficulties I outlined earlier is basically to use stop machine. Um, so how we use it is basically there's a patching CPU, the CPU patcher, and a bunch of, uh, you know, secondary CPUs. All of them essentially work in a lockstep state machine. Interrupts are disabled. You don't need IPIs uh, for a sync core. Um, and you also know that g given that you are essentially hogging all the vCPUs, uh, all the CPUs, you know that no PV lock ops are on the stack because you know all other threads are scheduled out and you're not executing any PV lock ops. So it's a cowardly way of uh, getting rid of a lot of the difficulties. And uh, the the only remaining risk is is NMIs, and because you know NMIs can come, they can uh, to, on on the primary or the secondary, or both. Uh, and you know the NMI handler can then you know execute a spin lock. Um, the so that spin lock, if you're modifying that particular site right then, would end up going to the in three handler and you know you could have a deadlock there so so to avoid that the in three handler also needs to implement a subset of the state machine it essentially uh, because all cpus are participating in the state machine you have to kind of ensure that the state machine keeps moving and uh, and and you know whichever context you are in whether you're in thread context or in in three context and with that, you can make forward progress. Um, if you have multiple NMIs, that complicates matters somewhat, but uh, I won't go into that right now. All right, so, so this is kind of an example of um, what the state machine really looks like. 
normally you would you would use uh, ipis to to do some of this here as you can see you know uh, the cpu x essentially uh, does a has does smb con load uh, with require semantics to you know progress to the next stage now what is each stage so uh, the the commented out section actually goes through you know how the the op codes are really arranged so the first step is you you just patch the the int three. That's that's what the patcher does. It just it replaces the first byte with int three. It does a local sync, and it's you know changes some state with release semantics. Um, and you, the, all all the secondary CPUs they basically do acquire for that state. You know, so the state would be say int three written. Uh, once they see that you know essentially in three has been written they do the sync uh then you know you can go and safely uh, the patcher cpu can go and safely write the rest of uh, the the state a uh, rest of the opcode bits and you know anybody trying to execute this would at this point in time end up in the in the in three handler right uh yeah so so you write the rest of the state um you make sure that uh, that the patcher has written it um, on on the secondaries. If it has, you you do your sync, and then uh, all that remains is for the patching CPU to write the first byte, which it does, and your iteration is is complete. It works. The only problem is this is stop machine, which kind of sucks, and. Um, you know, when I sent this to upstream, there was a review comment, which I think in, in hindsight was pretty understated, which called it bong hits crazy code. So, so now V2. So you want to patch multiple sites atomically, right? Uh, your other CPUs could be executing arbitrary code, including spin lock code. Um, and in any case, you know, patching even a single site is not atomic. There are multiple steps and each step, um, even in itself can get interrupted by, by an NMI. All right. So, so the first step is you first introduce a site local barrier everywhere. And the what this allows you to do is it allows you to control what executes. So until the site local barrier is everywhere, um, you know, you just emulate the old code. So one step one is done. Um, you need to introduce a global barrier. Um, and the idea behind the global barrier is that uh, before this, this barrier, you are only going to be executing old PV lock ops. After this barrier, you execute only new new ops. The, the important condition for this barrier is that there should be no spin locks uh, and, and thus you know no executing PV lock ops in the system. And and once you have transitioned you know to the, the new PV lock ops you're kind of done. All that you need to do is you need to stop emulating. So you go back and and uh, replace the in three that you that you prefixed with the with the real op code. Okay. So so you know most of the the work is really in the in the global barrier. How do we actually get a global barrier when you have multiple vCPUs? Fundamentally, what you need to do is you need to count all spin locks under execution. And uh, the, the counting needs to happen in the int three handler, which is good, you know, a single point where everything kind of converges. Uh, uh, of course, they, there is no real way of counting spin locks. Uh, good spin lock is, is not a PV lock op. So, so, uh, so you don't even know where, where all of them are in the, in the kernel or in the modules. All that you have, uh, uh, is what you can get via the in three handler 
which is the rest of the five opcodes, not uh, huge spin lock. Um, what's the property that this global barrier uh, holds essentially? So, so the barrier itself is, is, is you know, pretty simple. Um, you either be a RCU or, or a work queue or something like that. You essentially execute this patch barrier on all CPUs, uh, except for the worker. Let's say it's, this is in work queue context. So at this point, you know, when you're executing this barrier, you know that you're not, you don't actually have any locks. Uh, on, on that CPU, you, th there are no spin locks uh, uh, in that context on that CPU. So at that point in time, you can switch that CPU to a state where it says, you know, barrier executed, right? Um, and, and you can essentially act that, uh, yeah, it, this, this CPU has executed the barrier. And that from this point on, this CPU needs to count uh, active lock ops. Active lock ops, when it falls to zero, um, means that there are no ongoing spin locks, let's say, or PV lock ops really in the system. And at that point, it's, it's safe to switch. So that's the property in the next line. All CPUs have uh, have executed this barrier and no active lock ops in the system. Um, so if the first line is, uh, the, the first clause is untrue, uh, the barrier CPUs is less than uh, num online CPUs, then you could have active lock ops on, you know, uh, on, on some, on, on a bunch of CPUs, but some of them are actually counting these active lock ops, some are not. But once this condition is true, you know that all active lock ops in the system are actually getting counted. And um, and then, you know, there, there, there are issues here, you know, spin lock is a really hot path and uh, and, and so you might have to wait for a long time for this condition to be to be true. Um, and until then, you know, you would kind of slow down the system. But you, if the load is too high, you can just abort and you can do things like that. But um, but but this condition is is um, sufficient to transition to this new stage. A little more on uh, what we are counting and how we are counting. So first of all, notice what we cannot count. We cannot count the fast path. The, we have no control over queued spin lock. Uh, that does not go through the breakpoint handler. So we cannot count invocations of the fast path. So there can be spin locks executing in the system. Uh, you know, you would only see them when uh, they call queued spin unlock. Uh, what you can count is the slow path. And the great thing is that the slow path also protects the data structure because the data structure only gets accessed in the slow path. Or it might get accessed in the unlock if a different CPU has gone through the slow path for the same spin lock you only really need to be able to tell the difference between the two uh, queued spin unlocks because you know one got one gets executed in the fast path um, so you know you should not be dropping a reference there but you you take a reference in queued spin lock slow path which you should be dropping in the corresponding queued spin unlock um, the the one part of data structure that gets accessed is the bit representation, uh, which marks whether this lock is taken or not. And that is constrained to be compatible for both of the spin lock types, because queued spin lock is, com is the same for, you know, uh, both of the spin lock types. So queued spin unlock has no choice 
but to use the same good representation. And um, so, so the only remaining problem is uh, being able to tell the queued spin unlocks apart in, in you know, both of these cases. And that you do by just keeping you know, some sort of a per CPU bit map. And, um, and that's all there should be to, to V2. You can find the code here on GitHub. Uh, V2 is mostly uh, design documents. V1, you, you can get the code on GitHub and uh, the patches on LKML. And uh, thanks for attending the talk. Um, if you have any questions, I'll take them. If not, um, I'm happy to receive them on, on email or if you want to collaborate, just drop me an email. All right, thank you very much.